Hello, I want to <clears throat> welcome all of you back again, once again to our uh, Sunday, more, Sunday uh, Bible studies uh, coming to you from University Assembly of God Church in Waxhachie, Texas. Those of you who have been with us, you know that the uh, last, last week, since we were approaching Thanksgiving, I decided to do uh, a lesson on Thanksgiving. And uh, today, I'm going to begin a series on uh, that uh, going to be a Christmas emphasis for the season. And uh, don't know for sure how many will go uh, three or four more Sundays here before Christmas, and we'll just see how it goes. And uh, so I'm going to get the PowerPoint going here for us uh, right now, and we'll just see how it's going to go. All right, there we go. And okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I have a what I call a uh, annual Christmas quiz, and I'm going to state some questions, and then in these series we will uh, develop answers to those questions. I think I have about uh, maybe 17 questions altogether. We'll see, and uh, so. Uh, we won't plan to cover all of them today. It'd be too much for us to do that. So I'm going to go through all the questions before we, before we start uh, answering any of them. And so if you want to write them down and then be looking up uh, the answers to them, uh, just for the fun of it and see, um, see how well you do on the ones ahead of time, then uh, that would be a good idea. Good thing for you to do maybe. And the first question that we're going to be considering is, which one of the gospel writers emphasized uh, the Emmanuel, God with us idea? One of the four gospels, of course, and which one was that? And then uh, why, why, why did this gospel writer have this emphasis in his account? What might be the reason or reasons that this writer included an emphasis on Emmanuel. And then question number three is going to be, which gospel writer does not tell anything about the Christmas incarnation event, but rather just assumes it? That is, this uh, particular gospel writer didn't tell about the birth or any part, really, of uh, uh, the beginning of Jesus' life. And uh, so which one of the writers was that? And once again, what might be the reason that this gospel writer did not include anything about the birth of Jesus? Question number five, <clears throat> which gospel writer tells us about the shepherds going to see the Christ child at the manger in Bethlehem? Now, for all of these, the, the answer to the which gospel is only one, only one gospel. And so it is the case here that only one of the gospels tells of uh, this part of the story about the shepherds going to see the Christ child in the manger. And so, again, which one of those is that? And why did that gospel writer include this? The others didn't see fit to, so why did this writer include it? Question number six, What might then what might be the reasons, I already stated that question, didn't I? What might be the reason or reasons that this gospel writer included the story of the shepherds. Question number seven, which gospel writer gives the most, quote unquote, profoundly theological account of the Christmas incarnation event? Which one of the gospels gives the most profoundly theological account of the Christmas incarnation event? And again, uh, why did this writer give an account of this nature about the Christ, uh, Christmas incarnation event? Uh, that is about Jesus coming into this world to be the Savior. Uh, what, what, uh, why did the, why did the gospel writer develop this particular account of this event? Uh, question number nine: uh, Which gospel gives the most emphasis on the Spirit's role related to the Christmas incarnation event? That is, which gospel writer? emphasizes the spirit in this whole story of uh, Jesus' birth and uh, 
uh, coming into the world, being incarnated and uh, coming into the world. Which one of the Gospels gives that, does that, emphasis? And again, why did this Gospel writer emphasize the role, uh, the role of the Holy Spirit more than the others? And, it's, and incidentally, we're going to see this considerably more. Uh, one of the writers uh, emphasized the Holy Spirit in all of this much, much more uh, than any of the other gospel writers. It's in interesting, and we're going to talk about uh, why. And which one of the gospels tells us about Simeon and Anna uh, with baby Jesus in the temple? And again, uh, what might be the reason or reasons that this gospel writer included this story? Again, it's unique to this gospel. No one else included it. Why did this gospel writer decide that it was important enough to include? And incidentally, I'm, uh, I'm considering that. Uh, 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 well, let's, let's move on here. Maybe it'd be better for me to say what I'm going to say there uh, just a little bit later. How long was it after Jesus' birth uh, that, Simeon, that the Simeon Anna event occurred? And that's a really important question because the fact of the matter is, uh, it was uh, sometime after Jesus' birth. Jesus was, and so the, we want to answer that question, how long was it? And uh, so, uh, okay, yeah, all right. Uh, which one of the gospel writers tells about the visit of the wise men to uh, Jerusalem and to uh, uh, Bethlehem to see uh, Jesus? Um, and here, uh, again, uh, well, went too far there. Let's, let's go back a bit. What might be the reason or reasons that this gospel writer included the story of the wise men? You see, it's important when you see these different things in these gospels, it's important to consider the question, why did they include it? What is there that's important about it that it would be included Enough so that the other gospel writers didn't include it, but this particular gospel writer did. And then the question with this one also is, how long do most Bible students think it was after Jesus' birth that the wise men arrived in Jerusalem and why? I'll give you one little hint. It was uh, much longer than, it, uh, than the Simeon and Anna uh, event occurred. And uh, yet the story of the wise men is very, very often included, well, almost, all, almost always included in the quote-unquote Christmas story. When you, when you do some Christmas pageant with children at a church, uh, they got to include the wise men in this wonderful story. And yet it was uh, some considerable time after Jesus' birth that, uh, that this event occurred. And so that raises interesting questions. And... Uh, uh, suggests that if we're going to consider the wise men as a part of the story, well, certainly the one we just did, Simeon and Anna, uh, needs to be a part of that as well. So uh, we get both of them in here. And then one of the, possibly one of the most interesting questions here is the final question that we will address, uh, and that is this. Uh, how did the wise men know that there was a king of the Jews uh, to be born at that time. Can you give a possible answer as to how the wise men knew about a king of the Jews to be born at that time? It's, uh, isn't that an interesting question? How did they know? They knew somehow. And so it's a very important question. Very interesting question. So we'll be addressing those uh, 17 questions as we go through this series. And I've decided to just uh, do them, uh, put them in this order for a particular reason of addressing them in, in this order. So now we're going to go back to then uh, question number one. Uh, which gospel writer emphasizes the Emmanuel God with us idea? Some of you may have already uh, may already know that answer to this question. Um, if you do, that's great. If you do, uh, give yourself a pat on the back. 
the answer to this question is Matthew. And the account is in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And I'm just going to read those two verses here out of my New American Standard Bible. And, uh, okay, uh, Matthew, okay, I guess I better get in the right chapter. Here we are. Here we are. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. All of this, uh, Matthew has just told us about uh, uh, Jesus' uh, uh, birth, or he's leading up to it at least, and uh, he says, with regard to these events of Jesus' birth, all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Quoting the Old Testament, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Uh, the you, a lot of a lot of people uh, have no idea really about the fact that Matthew got this passage from the Old Testament. He didn't just he didn't just make a statement here. He was uh, he was uh, quoting and using a passage in the Old Testament in from the book of Isaiah. And you hear ministers preach on this almost every Christmas season, and few of them uh, bother to tell the background here. If they do refer to the to this uh, these particular passages, they don't explain uh, very much uh, uh, regarding them. Uh, they just go immediately to what we would call application, and that is God with us, which is very important, as we will see. But uh, they don't, uh, and so to me, that's uh, we ought to, we ought to do uh, we ought to do better than that. We ought to uh, get the original context here and see what questions, if any, that this raises. So uh, I'm going to go back to Isaiah chapter uh, seven, and I'm going to read verses fourteen through sixteen. Uh, and this is the prophet Isaiah speaking. He's speaking to Ahaz. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. And she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time, at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Now, when you stop and think about it, there's a lot of interesting questions raised here in this passage and how Matthew just takes it out, if you please, and applies it to Jesus Christ. If you have your Bible, you might want to turn there, but I want to read that again and listen. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. First of all, the therefore means we need to refer back to the previous uh, verses to see what therefore is referring to. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And then what's this business about eating curds and honey? What does that have to do with Jesus? Well, the fact of the matter is it doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. It doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. Uh, nothing said about Jesus eating curds and honey. At the time, he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. Before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. 
What two kings and what relationship do they have to Jesus? Again, the answer to that question is nothing. So how is it that Matthew is using this passage? Well, let me tell you the context and then we'll go from there. The context is uh, King Ahaz was a king of Judah at this time. And unfortunately, he was one of the evil kings. He was one of the kings of Judah uh, that did not follow Jehovah God as, as he was supposed to. And so the kingdom, uh, and of course, this is after the division of the kingdom, and this is the southern kingdom versus the northern kingdom of Israel. And so the nation was in very, very serious trouble because King Ahaz had led them away from the ways of God. Uh, and this was the southern kingdom. And the situation was that Jerusalem was being besieged by two kings from the north. And all the armies of these two kings were arrayed against Ahaz uh, outside the gates of Jerusalem. And the situation looks extremely bleak for Ahaz and the southern kingdom. It looks like that these two kings will of the north will be able to continue to lay siege to Jerusalem until they have to surrender. And uh, the armies will be a great surpassing uh, Ahaz's armies. And so uh, uh, Judah will be overtaken. But uh, King Isaiah, I mean, excuse me, prophet, uh, the prophet Isaiah comes on the scene. And uh, uh, he speaks to Ahaz. And in effect, what he does is he tells Ahaz that God is willing to help him. And so uh, uh, Isaiah says, if you will be willing, then uh, God will, quote unquote, be with you. God will be with you. Understand the idea there, the point? God will be with you. And so Isaiah says, just give, uh, ask God for a sign and he will, he will give a convincing sign that, he, uh, that he's speaking and, and that he will do what he says he's going to do. Well, old proud Ahaz says, oh, I don't want to tempt the Lord. I'm not going to do that. I, I won't do that. It wasn't because he didn't want to tempt the Lord. He was too, too proud to uh, yield to God's will. And so Isaiah says uh, what he says in these two verses. And now with that context, you understand. Therefore, Isaiah says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. He'll give you a sign anyway. Behold, a virgin. And here's what the sign will be. A virgin will bear, be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And before he is old enough to be weaned, uh, the kings, the two kings that you dread, uh, they will no longer be a threat to you at all. God's going to take care of the situation. Now, that's the context. And that's the situation. And the fact of the matter is, contrary to what most people think, probably, uh, uh, this uh, prophecy was uh, all fulfilled. It was all fulfilled, uh, at least about the, uh, the immediate context then, was all fulfilled in the time of Ahaz. And it's not beyond their own possibility, but most likely, and most Bible scholars do not think that Isaiah had Mary and Jesus in mind here at all. Now that may shock you, may surprise you, but actually this is the case in much of the prophecy in the Old Testament. Uh, the prophet who is prophesying at one particular time uh, just simply does not know everything about what they are saying sometimes. For example, this is the case when uh, Daniel uh, prophesies about Antiochus Epiphanes uh, coming into the city of Jerusalem and desecrating the temple in, uh, in the uh, intertestamental period between the 4,000 uh, B.C. 400 and uh, Jesus' birth. And what uh, Daniel prophesied about Antiochus Epiphanes 
all came to pass at that time, and Antiochus Epiphanes went into the temple and offered a swine there. But later we learn that that there's a uh, there's a uh, 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 there's a, uh, a further uh, fulfillment of this, or will be, in the person of the Antichrist in the last days. So what I'm telling you here about prophets prophesying certain things and uh, them not knowing really to the full extent uh, the coming situation is not, not uh, unusual at all. And so... I believe that uh, Isaiah, when he gave this to Ahaz, uh, most likely, uh, it's by far more likely that he did not know or did not have any idea concerning Mary and Jesus here on this occasion. So how is it then that Matthew applies this to Mary and Jesus? For the world, it looks like he just lifts it out of its context and makes it what he wants it to be. But wait a minute, let's look at this. What we have here is what is known, and what I've told you about Antiochus Epiphanes is the case here. What we have here is a situation, first of all, is what is known as the law of double fulfillment. And sometimes these are what you call types and anti-types. And so there'll be a there'll be a uh, earlier fulfillment of that prophecy, uh, as in this case here. Uh, it, it was a fact in Ahaz's day that uh, God came on the scene, and indeed he was with Ahaz. And uh, we don't even know all the historical details are not given, but the fact of the matter is, uh, very quickly, these two kings that were besieging Jerusalem and causing Ahaz all this uh, trouble uh, were no longer a threat to Ahaz. And so, uh, and sure enough, uh, back at that time, there was a young woman who gave birth to a child, and she called his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That all happened back there in Old Testament times in the time of Ahaz. Uh, but Matthew is telling us that there's yet further fulfillment to that, that idea. And notice what I said. There's more fulfillment to the idea. What idea? The idea of Emmanuel. And so uh, what we're talking about here is a part of what we call progressive revelation. Progressive revelation simply means God did not reveal everything uh, to mankind about himself and about his work and about uh, what he's uh, doing in this world all at one time. He starts, uh, in the, he starts in the Old Testament and gives us uh, some prophecy and then uh, things develop and he gives us some more and then he gives us some more revelation and he gives us some more revelation. And this has been happening for centuries and centuries and centuries. So uh, progressive revelation means there's God gives revelation and he builds on that and further builds on that and further builds on that until we get all the way through the Old Testament and same thing in the New Testament, progressive revelation. And a part of this is the law of double fulfillment that we're talking about here. And so uh, Matthew then was using uh, a play on words with regard to the word virgin. The word virgin uh, can actually have uh, two, uh, two uh, different, well, not uh, totally different meanings, but uh, I should say two meanings that uh, they are related uh, to one another. They're related to each other. Uh, the ver uh, term uh, virgin can refer to a young woman who has never had uh, sexual relationships with a man, a virgin. But also, especially in the Hebrew, can simply mean a young woman of marriageable age. Now, uh, uh, so we have to keep this in mind. And so Isaiah, you look at there and you notice that Isaiah said absolutely not one word about a virgin birth in the way that we think about Jesus Christ being uh, of a virgin birth. That is, there is nothing hinted or anything at all that uh, back in Ahaz's day, the birth of this child would be that kind of a miracle. 
And the fact of the matter is, I don't know there's uh, there any Bible teacher that thinks that there's been two virgin births in history, uh, Jesus in the first century AD and this one back there. No, it wasn't that kind of a thing. Uh, this young woman of marriageable age had sexual relationships with her husband. And incidentally, uh, some Bible scholars believe that that was Isaiah and Isaiah's wife and his child. I don't know for sure about that, but uh, anyway, a young woman, marriageable age, if she wasn't married at the time, got married, had sexual relationships with her husband and bore a child and called his name Emmanuel. Matthew is using a play on words here with that word, and it is totally clear in his uh, uh, context that he's talking about a supernatural birth because we're told that Mary and Joseph did not have sexual relationships before Jesus was born. That is, this was a virgin birth in the sense, in, the, in that particular sense, okay? So, uh, Jesus Christ. Now, here's, here's where Matthew was going. Here's where he was coming from, if you please, and where he was going. He picked up on the, actually uh, two words in here, uh, virgin and Emmanuel. And we just explained about uh, virgin. And here, Emmanuel, as the scripture tells us, as Matthew tells us, uh, is translated God with us. And so Matthew, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't, we don't, we can't do this ourselves. Uh, we don't go back in, in the Old Testament and use them, use things this way. That's, uh, that's a terrible uh, a fallacy. Uh, some people try to do that thing, but it's not correct. But when it is the Holy Spirit inspiring one of the inspired writers of Scripture, such as Matthew, then that's a different situation. And so I'm totally convinced that the Holy Spirit uh, brought to Matthew's attention this word virgin, and he's thinking about then the virgin birth of Jesus, and this word Emmanuel, God with us. And so he sees this as a way uh, to emphasize and bring out this point, because you see, Matthew understood that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the ultimate fulfillment of Emmanuel. Jesus Christ is the ultimate God with us, the ultimate God with us. So while the, the uh, so in that Isaiah was presenting this idea in the Old Testament context of God being with his people in a special way, Matthew sees that by God sending his son, Jesus Christ, he is sending to us the ultimate idea of being with us, of being Emmanuel. So God is with us in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, let's see, did I go backwards or what? Oh, so... Uh, what, what might be the reasons beyond this then that Matthew included this emphasis on Emmanuel? Well, Matthew here was writing to a Jewish audience. He was wanting to help his fellow Jews understand the, the reality and the truth of Jesus being the Messiah. And as we all know, the Jews were having a difficult time accepting this. And so Matthew wants to help in this. And so he's writing to a Jewish audience. And his Jewish audience would have understood this type of interpretation and application that we've just been describing to you. Uh, in fact, the rabbis, uh, this was a uh, one of the uh, main practices of the Rabbis, the rabbis would do this kind of thing. They would go back into the Old Testament and and uh, and then uh, by way of application, actually, they were using the scripture back there. Of course, they weren't uh, talking. They weren't bringing it into New Testament context because they didn't believe that. But they would they would go back into the Old Testament and use this kind of extrapolation 
and interpretation to bring uh, forward, if you please, uh, things written in earlier in the Old Testament to make application of them in the time that they were that they were teaching about these th various things. And so Matthew's Jewish audience would have been very familiar with this. Uh, they uh, would uh, had no reason to uh, question Matthew with regard to this, even though the story was about something that took place and completely took place, if you please, in Old Testament times. Uh, they would have understood this a type of interpretation and application. And they would have understood uh, that uh, G uh, that Jesus, I mean, excuse me, that Matthew was using this type of interpretation and application to make the point that Jesus' birth was a miraculous birth. It was a birth by uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. It was a virgin birth, a supernatural birth. So that Jesus uh, was not only the Son of Man, he was also the son of God. Uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna stop right there uh, because well maybe we're not. <laughs> yes, we are. I'm gonna stop right there. Uh, we're run out of time here for for now. So uh, be back with us uh, next week, and uh, we've uh, answered two of these seventeen questions. Uh, we'll see how far we get along next week, but I, I think this is all going to be very interesting to you, and I hope it uh, contributes uh, to your uh, the holiday season and our thinking about the birth of Jesus, Jesus coming to be our Savior. And uh, so I'm looking forward to getting back into this and looking forward to having you back with us. You have a good week, and uh, Lord bless you, and we'll see you next time.